Father, we're so grateful that you are our way maker. Lord, if we tried to testify, all of us, we wouldn't have enough time today or this week of all the times you've made a way for us. So we say thank you. Thank you for being a promise keeper. Thank you for being the light in our darkness when we thought we couldn't make it. Lord, you held us up. We just say thank you this morning. We just say thank you. We, we just say thank you, Lord. We, we just say thank you, Lord. We, we just say thank you, Lord. We, we just say thank you, Lord, because it had not been for you, Lord. We know we wouldn't even be standing here. And God, the devil tried to take us out, but you said no. God, there were some people who hated us that tried to take us out, but you said no. God, our finances tried to take us out, but you said no. Our health tried to take us out, but you said no, because you're a way maker. Thank you, Lord. And we worship you, and we honor you, and we love you, and, and we're not afraid to say it, God. We're not ashamed to say it. We, we say it unapologetically. We love the Lord Jesus. We love you today. And we'll shout it on the rooftops because you are a way maker. We thank you for being a miracle worker and for keeping all the promises you've kept. Thank you, Lord. And so have your way in this place. Have your way in the lives of your people in my life. Let us leave here a different people for your glory. We love you. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Can we celebrate the Lord? Can we celebrate the Lord? Can we celebrate him? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Did he hold your hand in the valley? Did he hold your hand? Did he keep the devil at bay? Did he heal your body? Did he bless you anyhow? You know you didn't, you didn't deserve it, but he blessed you anyhow. Is he just worthy? Is he, is he just worthy? Then say thank you. Then say thank you. I dare you to say thank you. I, I dare you to bless him. I dare you to bless him. You cannot bless the Lord. You cannot bless him. You cannot bless him. I dare you to say thank you. He'll turn your gladness. He'll turn your mourning into gladness. He'll take your pain and give you joy. He'll make your enemies your footstool. He loves you, church. He loves you, church. He loves you, church. Hallelujah. 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 I'm like the old folk. This may be my last time. Because I'm going to go on and say thank you. Because <laughs> he's worthy. I'm not leaving any praise on the table. I'm, I'm getting it all out. I'm getting it all out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's worthy. He's worthy. Amen. 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 God bless you. Yes, he's a way maker. Hallelujah. 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 He'll bring you through. He'll bring you through. He'll do it. He'll do it. He'll do it. Yes, he will. He'll do it. He'll do it. Amen. 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 God is good, isn't he? Isn't he good? Isn't he good? God is good. God is good. God is good. And hear me, church. There's no super saints in the kingdom. We all need him. We all need him. We all need him. Amen. Amen. We all need him. God bless you. God bless you today. God bless you. We're going to get in this word today. Uh, we're in this series, The DNA of a Follower, and uh, we've tried to lay out the idea that God calls us, based on 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that we're a royal priesthood. We're a royal priesthood. He's the king. He's the one that makes us royal in relationship with him. We are princes, princesses and princesses uh, in his kingdom. And so we're looking at what does it mean to be a follower? What does it mean to walk with Jesus? How does he want me to represent him in the world? And so we've looked at it a couple of ways. We looked at planting seeds as parents. Today I want to speak a word, if, if the Lord would allow me, if you would allow me, 
uh, to the women and, and how God wants you to be that priest. You're not in the liturgical sense, and some of you, God may never call you to the ministry to preach, but in a sense, every Sunday, I grab God's hand and try to grab your hand. That's kind of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to hear from God, trying to trust God to influence me so that he can influence you. And in that sense, that's what God wants to do in your life. That's what he wants you to do, to grab somebody's hand and to grab God's hand and bring it together. You know what God has done in your life, and now God has sovereignly positioned you to touch somebody in the same way he's touched you. Don't need a seminary education, don't need to know Hebrew and Greek, don't need to know historical theology or church history. As long as you know your history and what God has done in your life, guess what? He can make a difference in somebody else's life. Anybody know I'm telling the truth today? I'm just, I'm just telling you. Don't complicate this. Don't complicate it. Don't complicate it. God wants to use your life. God wants to use your life, and he will do it. Amen. So today, I want to talk to the ladies next Sunday. I want to share with the brothers. And so, brothers, don't skip out on me next Sunday. There's no football. Amen. <laughs> and uh, today, I do want to encourage the ladies and uh, look at one of, my, the favorite, one of my favorite books in the Bible. Uh, I just love the, this period of history with Israel, which is called the Exilic Period. It's a time when Israel went into exile. And yet, even though for 70 years they were in a place that was unfamiliar, God was faithful and he sustained them. Matter of fact, in the book of Esther today, it's a book, it's a book that never mentions the name of God. Not one time will you find the name of God in the book of Esther. You won't hear, thus saith the Lord. You won't see the name Yahweh, Jehovah, none of those things. But yet, most scholars say his hand and his fingerprints are all over the book. Amen. And, and that's, that's how my life is sometimes. You know, sometimes you can get in some dark places and you don't know if God's with you, but you know when you got through it, his hand was all over your life. Amen. So I love this book and, and, and just want to spend a little bit of time. I wish I could preach through it for a season, but it's, it's a great book. But this is where God has us today. And so in your handout, we're going to look at Esther chapter 4, verses, Esther chapter 4 verses 10 through 16. I want to read that this morning. And, and, and actually, I want to encourage you to read the entire book. It's a great story. Um, Jews actually celebrate a, a feast called the Feast of Purim, uh, which commemorates this event and how God delivered the entire nation from a annihil certain annihilation. Hitler was not the first that tried to annihilate all the Jews. There was a man named Haman who was a Persian who sought to do the same thing. And God protected his people. He prevented this annihilation from going forward through this woman by the name of Esther. And so look at this text, chapter 4, verse 10 through 16. Listen to these words. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servant, servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called. There is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that they may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come to the king. This is Esther talking, and they want her to go in to, to make intercession for the people. And she's saying, look, if I go into the king's presence and I'm not being called, he can kill me. Kill, kill his own wife, if you can believe that. Amen. Don't think that, brothers. Don't think that. Amen. All right? Okay, here we go. And so, so she, she's explaining this. So as for me, I have not been called to come into the king uh, during these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. Mordecai kind of get an attitude, didn't he? For if you keep silent at this time, deliverance and relief or restoration will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will surely perish, one translation says. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And I love Esther's reply. Look at this woman. Look at this great woman of God. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa. And hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, and though it is against the law, and if I perish, 
I perish. Tell you that, that takes some grit, don't it? So I want to talk about grit and grace. <laughs> I want to talk about grit and grace. Amen. I want to talk about that today. Y'all know who those three women are on, on the screen? Everybody know who that is? Okay. Y'all, y'all, no, seriously, y'all know for real? Okay, y'all know who's in the middle, right? If y'all know who's in the middle, I'm shutting this thing down today. Okay, that's, that's Michelle Obama. <laughs> And the other person is who? Who's the, who's the one on the right? Uh, Melissa, yeah, Melissa Harris Perry. Yes, very good. Yeah, yeah. And who's the other one on the other side? Shonda. Yeah, yeah. Women, women of grit and grace. Women of grit and grace. I raise that because they kind of remind me of my aunt that I lost two weeks ago. I lost my aunt. She was 91 years old, y'all. And watch this. If you saw her, you would think she was 75. I mean, she was rolling with it. She really had not been sick a day in her life. She had arthritis real bad, but her mind was still sharp, and her spirit was good. Unfortunately, she was on her way to the doctor, sitting in the car, and simply fell over and passed away. Uh, but she was a woman of really grit and grace, uh, a lot of grace. Um, Lord, she could make a homemade biscuit. <sighs> Jesus. And, and my family won't admit it, but in the funeral, everybody was saying, did she lead a recipe? Did she lead a recipe? <laughs> everybody was saying that. Oh, trust me. Boy, golly. And, and, it was, and I'm, I'm talking about scratch. We're not talking about this grand, some artificial stuff. No. This made up to look like a homemade biscuit. No. We're talking about the real deal from scratch. We're talking about a two-hour job. I mean, she made her dough the whole nine, and, and, and she would work it. And so I remember one time I was, I was preaching down there. And something happened. She usually makes me a batch when I come, and she couldn't get to it. I don't know what happened. And I wanted some so bad that I, I made an illustration in my sermon about homemade biscuits, that if Aunt Mary Hudson can make a homemade biscuit from scratch, don't you know God can take the scratch of your... I preached that thing, y'all. I, she was so moved, she went home that evening and made me a batch, y'all. Because <laughs> she was a woman of grace. She was a woman of grace. But now don't get it twisted. My auntie didn't play that. She had grit too. She really had grit. She did. I I never shall forget my cousin. I must have been about 20 at the time. Uh, He was 19. He got into it with a neighbor down the street. And they got into it so bad that the man, and the man was about 30, he knocked the rear window of his car out, knocked it out. And and then he told him he wasn't going to pay for it. And, and, and you got to pray for my family. You got to understand, my family, we're one or two types of people. We're either gangster or preacher. That, we, we don't know in between. We're going to shoot you or save you, one of the two. We're we going to do one of the two. And so my aunt knew that, that if the uncles went down there, they were going to kill him. No, they, they, I'm, y'all, y'all looking at me crazy. They, they, they don't play. And so she said, no, I got it, I got it, I got it. So she went down there, and, and I don't know what she said to that man. She came back five minutes, didn't tell us what she said. The next morning, there was a man in the yard fixing my cousin's car that he paid for because my aunt had some grit, too. She didn't back off. And, and, and that's my word, ladies, uh, if I can just share with you. Um, I love the fact that I think most women understand they need grace. You understand that. But also, also you need a little grit, too. You need a little grit. Unfortunately, sometimes that's lost in the Christian experience. We tend to be all grace and lose the grit. But, but, it, but God calls you to be a woman of God, to be that priestly go-between like Esther. God wants you to have the right balance of grit and grace. It's the right balance. It's the right symbiosis. You, you're not less of a woman because you have grit, okay? You're not less of a woman. And you're not more of a woman if you have too much grace, Matter of fact, if I can say it like this, too much grace. Some of you, you, you have too much grace, if I can say it. And grace is always good, but even God doesn't have too much grace. But some of you, you have a lot of grace, you have a lot of tenderness, you have a lot of joy in your life. You're the first one to give. You're a giver. You, you give people the benefit of the doubt, and that's a good place. The problem is if you give too much grace, sometimes people will walk over you. Sometimes people will take you for granted. Am I right about it? They won't appreciate the things that you've done. And, and grace is a good thing, but you got to be careful to make sure you don't have too much grace. You need to add some grit to your grace. 
But then some of my sisters here today, you've been through some stuff. You, you've been through some abuse. You, you've, you've been in a family that has not been kind to you. you. You've been through some betrayals. You've experienced some personal losses. And, and the stuff you've been through, it's caused you to be a little gritty, a little gritty, you know. And, and the truth is, to be fair, it's not a bad thing. If you weren't gritty, you wouldn't be here. You, you needed the grit. The people that should have been in your life to protect you were not there. The, the men in, life, in your life that should have been there to love you, to protect you, to preserve you were not there. And so you've had to lean on grit. The problem is all grit and no grace, folk don't want to be around you. Sometimes we can be so bitter. Listen, we don't even want to be around ourselves. And so God says to you, listen, you do need some of that grit, but you can't be grit all the time. You got to mix your grit with your, come on somebody, amen. It's got to be a harmony. It's got to be a symbiosis. It's got to be the right balance. A little bit of grit and a little bit of grace. I love how Maya Angelou said it. She says, we delight in the beauty of a butterfly but rarely admit the changes the butterfly has gone through to achieve its beauty. The butterfly is beautiful at the end of its metamorphosis, but it had to go through some gritty transformation to get there. And, and some sisters here today, maybe it's a grit season in your life. You, you're trying not to succumb to the grittiness of your situation, and you're trying to hold on to your grace. There's some grit even to get out of that gritty situation. God wants you to have that proper balance between grit and grace. And, and that's what we see with this woman today, Esther. She's an amazing example. I just, I believe she manages that well. She's, she's not a priest in the liturgical sense or the religious sense, but understand her role is very priestly in the metaphorical sense because God uses her to save an entire nation. She saves a nation from annihilation. A man by the name of Haman has got it in his mind in Esther chapter 3 that he wants to kill all the Jews. He has one bad experience with one Jewish man, Mordecai, and he draws the wrong conclusion, draws stereotypical conclusions that are not true. And he decides that everybody ought to be destroyed. And that's his plot. He actually gets it written as law. And God uses this amazing woman of God, Esther, to save an entire nation. And I believe there's some principles that we can learn from her life today, ladies, that can encourage you to be a woman like Esther, a queen that lives in the balance of grit and grace. First thing I want to suggest to you, number one, you've got to embrace the surrogates that God gives you. Embrace the surrogates that God gives you. If you, if, gives you. if you know anything about Esther's story, Esther lost her parents at a young age. We, we don't know exactly how it happened. We do know when this period of history, which is called the exile, that's the time when Israel carried, uh, Babylon carried Israel into what is called captivity, and then Babylon was taken over by the Persian Empire. We do know a lot of Jews died, and many believe that maybe that's when her parents died, but that a, at a young age, she lost her parents. But thank God, uh, her cousin by the name of Mordecai took her in and raised her, adopted her and raised her. Uh, as his own daughter. Look at verse 7. He was bringing up Hadassah, that was her Jewish name, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and mother died, here it is, Mordecai took her in as her own daughter. Took her in. Embrace your surrogates. Don't, don't look down on your surrogates. I, I've, I've got both my parents. I had them most of my life. Um, all of my life, I should say, but even me with both my parents, because they're not perfect, and they'll tell you they're not perfect. I needed surrogates. I needed other father figures in my life. I needed other mother figures in my life. Uh, again, my aunt I just talked about, she was a mother figure with all her grit and grace. Uh, she would encourage me while I was in school, you know, you stay in there. That's where I would stay when I was in college. I would stay at her house and just learned a lot, and she shaped my life. I had uncles. I, I never shall forget my uncle Luck. That's his name. His name is William Thomas, but we call him Luck. And, and he influenced me. He introduced me to basketball, played basketball with me, helped me be a pretty good basketball player in high school. And he was a surrogate. Didn't replace my father. No, I had my father. My father was wonderful in my life. But even me with both parents, I needed surrogates. And, 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 and hear me today. I'm, I'm not 
suggesting that a surrogate can replace the irreplaceable people in your life. There's a part of you that you will always miss certain people that are not in your life. But I do believe this. The grit of life is that you're going to have pain. It's inescapable. Everybody has pain. The grace is God will give you people that will help shape your life and help you get to a better future. Am I right about it? And so sometimes, y'all, we can grieve the past, but we can still embrace the people that God has given to us. We can embrace the models. We can embrace the examples. And ladies, I want to encourage you. There's some wonderful people that God has placed in your life. Not everybody can be a surrogate in your life. I get that. But the ones that God has given you, you've got to embrace them. You, you've got to use them as a model for how God wants you to carry your life. Let them speak into your life. Let them help you be a better woman. I, I have men in my life that I confess my faults, I'm accountable to, and they point out issues, not because they're mad with me. They say, Archery, you can be a better man. And, and they're kind of like surrogates in my life. And I want to encourage you, don't, don't back away from that, because there's a better woman in you that God wants to bring out of you. There's a greater woman in you, a greater queen that God wants to bring out of you. And sometimes it takes somebody else seeing in you what you can't see in yourself. Embrace your surrogates. And understand this, with every pain you've had, God can write a new story. I don't care what your pain is. Can you imagine this, this woman, Esther, in a foreign country, foreign language, foreign culture, no mom, no dad. Can you imagine the isolation she was feeling? And yet God took her worst pain and wrote a better story. And I understand how pain works. Pain is inevitable. But when you're in it, it feels like it's forever. Am I right about it? Amen. You wonder if it's going to ever end. You wonder if morning is going to ever come from that midnight. And it just seems like it's forever. And the danger is, ladies, is to think that there's finality to your pain. And I'm so glad that Esther didn't stay in chapter 2. She would have missed the future that God had for her. She would have missed the throne. She would have missed the queen being the queen of a nation. She would have missed the opportunity to be known as the woman that saved the people. So now she was not only in the history records of the media Persian chronicles, now she's in the biblical text because she moved past her past. And I want to tell you, God can write a better story. God has something greater for you. If you trust God for what he's preparing for you, he will take away the pain in your life. And so I really saw this vividly when I was traveling back from my aunt's uh, funeral two weeks ago. I was on the plane and two seats over, there was a little six-month-old little girl that was just crying the whole time. That's all she did. Cried her little heart out. And it's almost as if she knew Pastor Archie was going to be on that plane, and she was destined and appointed by God to just cry and frustrate Pastor Archie, knowing he had to preach the next day, and he's trying to get his little Sunday school lesson together to preach to his wonderful congregation. But no, this child just cried and cried and cried and cried. And so Daddy held it. And the more Daddy held the child, the child even cried louder, just got louder, louder than the engines, just louder. And I can tell because I've had... I've had children. I've had infants. I said, that's a unique cry. That's not a diaper change cry. I said, that's a bottle cry. That's a bottle cry. I know a cry. So I'm saying to myself, give that child a bottle. Give that child a bottle. But no, they just going to keep on bouncing. No. And the more they bounce, the, the angrier the child gets. So finally, the mother took the child. I'm thinking the mother going to feed the child. Surely mama knows her child. That woman kept on bouncing, <laughs> bouncing with the child. I'm, I'm like, feed the child. Finally, she pulled out a bottle fed the child, and the child stopped crying. But here's what blew me away. The child didn't stop crying once she got the bottle. The child stopped crying when mama was making the bottle. See, when the child saw the mama pull out the bottle, it's almost as if she knew mama had a history of preparing something good for her, and if she waited on mama, mama was going to deal with the pain. Now watch this. She was still hungry. But the fact that she could see that mama was making something in the meantime, put the pain on the back. I wish I had a witness in here today. If you focus on what God is preparing for you in your future, won't he assuage the pain in your life? Hallelujah. God has something for you. You can come through it. Embrace your surrogates. If you don't have any, find a surrogate 
pray about somebody, somebody that can help you to your future. Because I can tell you right now, just as that mother was preparing that bottle for that baby, God is preparing something for you. And the best thing you can do is to prepare yourself what God is preparing you for. Amen. I think I just said something. Embrace your surrogates. Number two, embrace the greater beauty. Embrace the greater beauty. Again, we said Esther's a great story. She's a one of God. God used her to save a nation. Now, wait a minute. She was an exiled Jew. She was an immigrant in a country where she was a sixth-class citizen. How did she save an entire nation? Well, she saved the nation because God elevated her to be the queen of the nation. And in a position of prominence, God would use that place of prominence and influence to save her people. Oh, wait a minute. How did she become queen? Well, chapter 2 tells us that the nation had a beauty contest. And out of all the women, the thousands of women in the nation, she entered into this beauty contest and Esther won. Girlfriend was good looking on the outside. When the king got one look at her, he couldn't take his eyes off her. But there was something else going on in this, and I want you to see it in the text. Please don't miss it. She did win the contest, but it was not because of her external beauty. Look at the text. Verse 15, when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except that Haggai, the king's eunuch who had the charge of the women advised, advised. Now Esther was winning favor. There it is. Circle that word favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to the king, to King Ahasuerus into the, his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth in the seventh year of the reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women. And she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen. He loved her because of favor. Now, now favor is a two-headed coin. In Christian circles, we tend to see it on one side. Favor is about a God who can open doors no man can close. That, that's exactly what favor is about. God, God can do something in a way that even if the devil and all the imps in hell try to come against it, it's going to happen. Can I bless somebody? When God gets ready to bless you, you can't even block your own blessing. You, you can't even block your own blessing. God's just that good, and, and, and that's God's favor. He can make things happen that no one, nothing on earth can block. But there's another side. When the text says that she had favor with people, or she had favor with men or favor with the king. It's a word about her heart belonging to God. It's a word about somebody who had genuine purity and authenticity and character. Write this down in your handout. It's not in your handout. Second Chronicles chapter, chapter 16, verse 9. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. Here's what it says. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. In other words, God is looking through the highways and byways for people who love him, for people who trust him. And the trust shows up in how they live their lives and how they carry themselves. That's what the word is. Uh, you can put here also Job 31 and 4. Does he not see my ways? See, Job, if you remember the story, he's upset with God. He's upset with the fact that he's going through all this trouble, and he knows he's a man of good heart. And he's like, wait a minute, God, there's a contradiction here. I'm going through all this difficulty, but you know my heart is sincere because you're a God who sees the heart. And so the point is God's favor is a work that God can open doors that no man can close. On the other hand, the favor has to do with my heart for him and my love for him. So hear me, ladies, hear me. And so God sees Esther's heart. Moreover, the king sees her heart, and the people see that there's something deeper than the physical beauty. And so here it is. So why does Esther win the beauty contest? Because the greater beauty is not external, but the greater beauty is on the inside. The greater beauty is not the weave she had on, ladies, but the greater beauty was the warmth in her heart. 
The greater beauty was not just clothing and dress. The greater beauty was her character, her dignity. She, she was a woman of character. And hear me, ladies, um, if you need to clean it up, clean it up. Do, do all the stuff on the outside. Get the hair, the nails, whatever, whatever. Do, do all of that. Look good. Brother wants his lady. Come on, brothers. Can I get it? A... All right. See, y'all, y'all going to make me testify. I, I, uh, my, my wife, and I celebrate her. She's in the back right now. But uh, this weekend, she, she, uh, she retired. She retired. Amen. She retired. And so I celebrated her. She said she didn't want a party. She didn't want all that. You know, she just wanted, wanted to go to dinner with her husband. So I took her to a very nice place. Uh, you know, pastor had his Mac gang going, all right? And um, amen, amen, amen. Had my, had my Mac gang going, took her to a very nice place, and, and, and I bought her something nice from Tiffany's. Because I wanted her to know there's nothing in Tiffany's that's more valuable than you. Preach, pastor! I was working that thing because I want her to be, I want her to feel good about herself on the outside. But let me tell you what makes my wife special. There's nothing like the beauty she has on the inside. Yeah. And, 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 and here's, here's all I'm saying, ladies. Hear me, hear me. Listen, listen. Here's all I'm saying. Um, um, uh, somebody said it so well. Outer beauty captivates the eyes. Inner beauty captivates the heart. Not discounting you want to look good. That's good. You ought to do that. Look good for your man. Look good for yourself. But, but here's my question. The work you put in on the outside, do you put in equal work on the inside? Some of y'all looking at me right now. I know yesterday, all day, in the chair, <laughs> getting that hair right. When was the last time you spent all day before the Lord? <laughs> Getting your heart right before the Lord. You've got to ask yourself the question, because here's what I know. You spend so much doing cosmetic work, we can be cosmetic with the issues in our life. And we can decorate it. Listen, and we got to ask ourselves the question, are we interested in feeling good about ourselves, or do we want to be a better person? Because some of y'all know some folk, they get the hair done, they get the toes, the toes done, they get the, the toenails done, they get the weave done, they get all that stuff. But on the inside, they're the same person. And, and, and listen to me this morning. When God does a work on us, it means we got to grow through it. There, there, there shouldn't be a day that we wouldn't change. So give me my slide with my uh, compass and my clock. This is something I share with the men. This is life. This is life right here. It's a compass on the left and a clock on the right. The compass is where you're headed. That's your destiny. The clock is what you do daily. And I tell guys all the time, and I tell you, what you do daily will ultimately determine your destiny. And, and here's how God works in my life. I have to grow and do something different every single day. Every single day, I got to do something different. Whether where it's some difficulty in my life, if I want to be a better person, the only thing guaranteed is that I attempt to grow as a person. And I'm not talking about just growing in my walk with God. You ought to grow in your walk with God. You ought to grow in prayer. You ought to grow in his word. But let me tell you something. All the stuff you go through, he's trying to grow my character. He's trying to grow your heart. He wants to grow your grace, and he wants to grow your grit. Not some crazy, lost your mind grit, but a holy grit that honors God. Is there growth happening in your life every day? And so I'll tell you, I'll tell you a couple of years ago when I did the uh, disc test, uh, I was a 15 on the D. I'm a high D, high, high D, 15. My wife's a D and we've been married 30 years. Y'all know God is real. Two D's live in the same house. Who Lord, that is World War 10 right there. But she was, she was proud of me because I took it again and my D went from a 15 to a 12. And some of y'all don't know this. You don't know this. I know y'all think relationships come easy. So, well, Pastor, you know, you just get up there and you preach. I'm, half the time, I'm scared to death up here. 
scared to death, trembling, wondering, is this what God wants? And because because naturally, because I grew up as an only child, I don't need none of y'all. I just go into my little shell. I don't need none of y'all. In the name of Jesus, I'm good all by myself. I'm serious. Do I have any only children? Know what I'm talking about? We will make it by ourselves, won't we? Yes, we will. We don't need none of y'all, okay? And so I have to work. I have to work every day. Every day. I got to call people and work at relationships. I got to work at it every single day. And let me tell you something. Some of y'all got great dreams. I'm going to preach this. Some of y'all got great dreams. Some of y'all got great goals. Here's what you don't understand. You're not going to get there without somebody going with you. I'm telling you, you are not going to get there. Some of y'all got great dreams, great goals, great ideas. You got great vision for what God wants to do in your life. But what you got to understand, the difference between a vision and a dream is that the dream is all about you, but it ain't going to satisfy you. But a vision is about you and the people you can help along the way. You're going to have to have somebody with you. And so my word is, ladies, is to grow through it, to grow through it. And so let me give you just very quickly four traits of indispensable beauty. It's not, in your, it's not in your handout, but very, very quickly. Number one, you need grace. Don't let the external conditions alter your inner disposition. Keep your grace at all times. I like how Maya Angelou put it. I've learned that even when I have pains, I don't have to be one. Amen. Preach, Maya. Maya was a bad girl, wasn't she? Don't, don't be mad at me. Maya said that. I didn't say it. Number two, courage. And let me say this to every woman in here. The fact that you're here and the fact that you're still moving forward says you have courage. You have courage. We're still a culture that does not honor the value of women. I don't care what anybody say. And if you saw that video that went down in Deep Bellum and how that sister was dogged, you know exactly. And, and if you only got a misdemeanor on that, I'm going to tell that sister, next time you need to have some grit. You need to have your own 45. The next time somebody do that, you go on and let them know you don't play that. Yeah, I said it from this pulpit. Because a woman's life, particularly a black woman's life, is not valued in the same way as another American citizen. And, and for most of y'all, you have courage every single day that you go to work and you deal with the stuff you do. You have courage. What I'm saying is don't you back up off that. You hold on to your courage. So you need grace, you need courage, but you need humility. And by humility, listen to me, I'm not talking about beating yourself up. I'm not talking about thinking less of yourself. That's not humility. That's humiliation. That's insecurity. Humility is this, and Rick Warren has a great, great uh, definition of it. Humility is not denying your strengths. Humility is being honest with your weaknesses. That's all. Humility is the ability to look in the mirror and say, look, there's some things in my life I need to fix, and I'm the only one that can fix it. I can't expect some man to fix it. I can't expect my family to fix it. I can't even expect the church to fix it. Sometimes it's just me and God. There's a great, there's a number of Greek words that's used to describe how God heals or Jesus heals in the gospel. One is therapeuo, in which we get the word therapy. And anytime you see that Greek word for a miracle, what it means is God can heal on the outside, but there's still some afterwork, some therapy that you walk through and grow through it together. And what it means is if we walk with God, it doesn't mean we're going to have it perfect tomorrow, but stay with God just a little while. Anybody know he'll make you better? Anybody know he'll grow you through it? Anybody know he'll heal your broken heart? If you walk with God every single day, you'll be a better person. And that's why some of y'all, it's your private time. Are you talking to God every day? You, you need that quiet time with him. Yes, you do. And let me tell you what your struggle is. Sometimes God is silent. He'll do that. Anybody know God will go silent on you? He'll go silent, I mean just blank. And you know what that means? It's time to worship him. It's time to bow down. It's time to give him the praise. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. That is a moment of worship. And many times, let me tell you what God is doing on that. He's trying to deliver us from feelings and move us into faith. Because too, too many of us to try to dictate or determine what God is doing in our life based on how we feel. But I'm so glad God doesn't move on my feelings. Because if God moved on feelings, I'd be in a bad place, y'all. But whether it's good or bad, God is good all the time. Whether I'm in the valley or on the mountain, God is good all the time. It's not based on feelings. 
And so embrace, embrace your surrogates, uh, embrace the greater beauty. Let God grow you. Hold on to what you have. But then the last one, here it is, embrace the road less traveled. And that's the one I want to lay out here. Verse 16, I love this verse. And again, the context, Haman in chapter 2, uh, he, he develops this plot, uh, this plot, this plot to destroy or to annihilate the Jews. He's, a, he's Hit, Hitler-esque in his attempt. And Mordecai, who is the adopted father of Esther, finds out about the plot, but he knows Esther is the queen of a nation, and she's in a position of prominence, and he wants her to use her position to save a people. Amen. And, and, and it's a word to all of us just on that. If God blesses you to get into position, you still have a responsibility to help those who are less fortunate than you to get over just in the way that God helps you get over. And, 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 and Mordecai let her know, listen, you in a position, but you're not there just for luxury. You're not there just to be pam- pampered. You're not there to brag about how big of a house you're living in or the kind of car you're living in. But God put you in that position because he knew one day he would need you to save a nation that could not save themselves. Don't ever forget where God has brought you from and where he has placed you. He places you to use you to help somebody else. And so Mordecai, I had to go remind her. I love how this text, he said, don't think that now because you're in the king's palace, you're going to get away with this yourself. In other words, you, you Jewish too. Can I say it like I wanted to? You black too. Don't get so high and forget that you black too now. Don't, 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 don't get it twisted. That's what he's saying in the text. Because sometimes we get to a certain place and we forget where we came from. And I thank God for more to chaos and say, wait a minute now. I got you when didn't nobody want you. And I know where you came from. Don't forget where you came from. But could it be that in this moment and this decision, God is trying to use you? to save a nation? Could it be all the losses that you've gone through? Could it be how you went through the beauty contest and you were chosen above all the women in the country that God put you in this place to save a nation? And I love her response in verse 16. And here's a woman of God. She may not get it the first time, but give her time. She'll come around. Hear me, brother. She may not get with it the first time, but if it's from God... And she knows it was God. Give her time. She'll come around. Look what she says. Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And I and the young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king. And though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. I like that. She was willing to travel the road, less travel. And ladies, that, that, that's what it means to be a woman of grit and grace. Sometimes you got to go where folk ain't willing to go. Sometimes you got to draw the boundaries that folk don't want to draw. Sometimes you got to stand up in places that other folk don't want to stand up in. And so I'm, I'm, reminded, I'm reminded of Vasti. I wanted, to, I wanted to close with something else, and I still do. But Vasti kept hollering me in this text. Because Vashti is the reason why Esther became queen. Vashti's story is in chapter 1. And, and Vashti, Vashti was the first queen. It, she was the king's first wife. But the king had had some victories and he was celebrating with his homies. And, and he was watching uh, the Playboy channel and had some strippers in his house. I'm just trying to make it real. I'm trying to make it real. It's in the Bible. Read it for yourself. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. I'm just giving you an archery translation. And so he had his boys, and they were drinking, and they were doing a little Hennessy and all that kind of stuff, and, and, and had strippers all in his club. And, 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 and he, was, he was thinking about his intimacies with Vashti, and, and he wanted Vashti to come strip for the fellas. And, and, and thank God Vashti had some grit. Because the sad thing is there's some women that would have done that just to stay in the place of luxury. But sometimes you got to take a stand and travel the road less traveled. 
And so Vasta said, no, you can't treat me that way. So she lost her house. Watch this. She lost her wealth. She lost her name. This is the last time you hear about her, but guess what she didn't lose? She didn't lose her dignity. She didn't lose her value. She knew she was a woman of God. And sometimes when you take a stand, sometimes you're standing up for your dignity. Sometimes you're standing up for your womanhood. And I'm talking to some woman. You may have to draw some lines with some folk. You may have to stand on what's right because God has made you to be a woman of value. God has made you to be a woman of grace. Stand up for your dignity. Stand up for your grace. Stand up for what you know is right. And God will lead you to your destination. Father, I bless you and thank you for this word. Man, I thank you for Esther's life. I thank you for this woman. Particularly in a day when women are still, and particularly black women, are treated as second and third and fourth class citizens. And and women in this country as a whole, not just black, but Latino and white, are still treated as second class and not valued as equals. And Lord, though you teach male leadership, submission does not mean submission to our evil desires. But it's a, it's a leadership that is godly, that preserves and protects the women that you've given to us. And so, Lord, I lift up every woman in this house. I lift up every daughter, every Esther here today, that God, she would, she would learn to balance in her witness for you both grit and grace. Don't be too gritty. Don't be too mean. Don't don't be gritty out of your pain. Nothing wrong with grit. But grit that is pain-oriented is not of God. But grit that comes like Esther did to stand and make a decision because that's what the Spirit of God does. That's the kind of grit that God wants these women to have today, Lord. And so I lift them up that you would continue to teach our sisters, your daughters, to walk in grit. But some, Lord, they, with all the grit, they've lost their grace, that tenderness, that joy, that peace, that freeness, that fullness that is so typical of our women, Lord. I pray even right now you'd restore it to know when it's grace not out of insecurity or a need to be accepted, but a grace that has come from you, from heaven, from on high. A grace that affirms the dignity that you've placed in every woman that's created in your image. The grace that gives a woman the confidence to walk into any room with her head held high and to receive the respect she deserves because she is made in your image. That's the grace we're talking about today. And so have your way today. Thank you for these wonderful sisters, my wonderful sisters, your wonderful daughters. And just as you bless Esther with great things in the future, Lord, I believe there's a great future for every one of them. Do it for your glory. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand. Clap of praise today. Stand to your feet.